The justification after they started their invasion, after the Second World War, with these various boats going out there, and the British government doing what it could to stop this, because it knew it would lead to terrible frictions between the enlarging Jewish population and the Arab population. The Irgun Lumi uh, and the Haganah, the official Zionist army, and the Stern Gang and various other terrorist groups, their policy was one of ethnic cleansing of the most brutal kind. Anything you've read about the SS in East Europe, ethnically cleansing areas, pales in comparison, in my opinion, to the sort of thing that the Jews were doing against innocent Palestinian villagers who simply wanted to tend their orange groves and uh, <coughs> their olive trees. Um, we've all heard of Dia Yassin, a village, small village, of no importance. You'd never, you'd never have heard of it uh, otherwise. Uh, the Stern Gang and the um, Irgun Swalumi combined together for that and went in with Sten guns and knives. Uh, women were, pregnant women were gutted. Uh, people were just machine gunned in their houses or on the streets where they were. Bodies were thrown into the well. One wretched little girl of 14 was stripped naked and paraded through the streets of the Jewish quarter of Jerusalem afterwards. And if you know how these Muslim people um, value uh, their modesty for that sort of thing to go on. And it was only one of a number of cases. Now this wasn't just done out of Jewish beastliness, Jewish sadism. Well sure they enjoyed themselves, but it wasn't just done for their gratification. It was done in order to so terrorise other Palestinian villagers about the place, that poor peasant people who could barely read were terrorised out of their wits. We, the British, didn't have enough people there to protect them, and they were driven out of their property. And then the Zionist propaganda machine said, ah, look, a land without people for a people without land. So they justified their invasion of these areas, Palestinian areas, saying that they've got no population. So why shouldn't the poor persecuted Jews, still rubbing their wrists where they're trying to hide their tattoos, why shouldn't these poor persecuted people go to where nobody is living anymore? And the media, we're going to the business about the media being controlled and owned by the Jews, it wasn't so bad then as it is now, but it was still significant, uh, didn't sufficiently or at all convey the point that the reason why those lands had suddenly become empty was because Jewish terrorism had driven those people abroad. And now there are still 600,000 Palestinians from those villages, 600,000 of them. Now they're not a very big population. That's a huge <coughs> proportion of the Palestinian people are living in squalid camps in Lebanon and elsewhere about in the Middle East. Um, and the Jews say, oh well, they're just Arabs, they're just living in another part of Arab land. Well, we're British, we're also European. How would it be if the Jews came along and ethnically cleansed us from our little island and drove us into France, God help us, or Germany, <laughs> or somewhere like that, and said, well, it doesn't matter. Uh, you British, you're just living in another part of Europe. W would you accept that? So why should the Palestinians accept that? <coughs> the terrorism was enormous. I'll get on a little bit later. You see this tatty little book here? And it's got lots of press cuttings. It's also got a, an affidavit in there from one of our old friends, Jim Sawyer, uh, who stood for the National Front on many occasions. He's uh, dead now, but he was a Palestine policeman. And I'll get on a little bit later the story how he and I tried to implement an arrest warrant against Menachem Begin, who was the leader of the Stern Gang, who hanged with piano wire 
sergeants, British Army sergeants, Mervyn Pace and Clifford Martin, hang them in the olive groves at Natania with, with piano wire. Why with piano wire? And on top of that cruelty, mind the bodies and the area around so that the rescue parties who went out there to come and cut down these wretched boys, they hoped that they would get blown up as well. And in the foreword to this book, The Revolt, it should have been called The Revolting, <laughs> Menachem Begin says, yes, and I'd do it all again with brass knobs on. It's in there. Uh, and Jim, uh, it's his affidavit there, and I tried to go before um, a British magistrate in Bristol because that's where Mervyn Pace lived and his brother until a few years ago was still doing cartoons in the Bristol Evening Post so the family's known in the area and we thought that a local bench would be um, interested and the magistrate, the Beaks heard, our, heard Jim's uh, introductory comments and they took a bit of evidence from me and they took the book and his affidavit and went away for two hours read his affidavit, studied bits in the book that we'd drawn their attention to, which included drawing their attention to the fact that the British government issued a wanted notice with a sum of £10,000. Now, in 1948, £10,000 was a lot of money. A lot of money. Uh, I mean, what would it be worth? What would £10,000 be today? Hundreds of thousands of pounds? About half a million. Hmm? About half a million. About half a million. When did you last see any police wanted poster offering half a million pounds. That shows how seriously that man was wanted because he was so wicked. But he became Prime Minister of Israel in 1977 and came to this country to see the Queen. I had a bumping acquaintance with somebody else who came to this country to see the Queen in 1963. His name was Jomo Kenyatta. And I voted. And I was pleased only to get 40 days in the slammer rather than the 18 months I was uh, expecting. Uh, but it, that point brings us back to my first point. Neutrality is complicity. We'll get back to Began in just a little while. But Israel was only created because of the capacity of the Zionist movement to suborn the politicians of Britain, France, Germany, and in particular the United States, to buy them <coughs> with cold, crude cash bribes. And it's because of that that, for example, um, there's one thing that Israel and I have got in common. Israel's birthday is the same as mine, May the 14th. Mine was 1943, Israel's was 1948. And America recognised Israel in 11 minutes. And you wonder why that might be. Well, there's a, it was, the answer was given. It's not categorical proof, because on all of these things you cannot get forensic categorical fingerprint type proof. But in this wonderful book by a very wonderful Israeli anti-Zionist called Israel Shahak, um, uh, Jewish History and Jewish Religion, and there's a foreword from that well-known literary troublemaker, Gore Vidal. And Gore Vidal says, Sometime in the late 1950s, that world-class gossip and occasional historian, John F. Kennedy, told me how, in 1948, Harry S. Truman had been pretty much abandoned by everybody when he came in to run for president. Then an American Zionist brought in two million dollars in cash in a suitcase aboard a whistle-top campaign train. That's why our recognition of Israel was rushed through so fast. Well, that comes from Jack Kennedy, who was later... I don't think he... Whatever else he was noted for, and Marilyn Monroe might well be able to give a lot of information about that which we don't need to know uh, but he wasn't noted to be in those sort of uh, areas a liar and uh, Gore Vidal um, was close to the centre of power politics in America because the Gore part of his name relates to the uh, 
Vice President Al Gore. There's a slight family connection. So, so Gore Vidal was an insider, and that was an insider speaking to an insider. Could I just say, before I move on from the earlier stages of the massacres and ethnic cleansing of the Palestinian people, very recently there was a letter in the Jewish Chronicle from one Samuel Hayek, chairman of the Jewish National Fund UK. And he waxed on about the creation, how the Jewish National Fund, um, the JNF's focus has been on developing, sustaining the environment in Israel. This has involved planting trees. <laughs> to accuse the JNF of being actively complicit in the ethnic cleansing of Palestine represented a distortion of the truth on the grandest scale. And here is a Jew, Dr. Barry Steer, writing in reply to that. <coughs> and he said... It's true that trees were planted by the JNF in Israel in the 1950s and 60s using donations from diaspora Jews. The narrative promoted by the JNF was that a barren, rocky land was being turned into a green oasis. As a child in the 1950s, I eagerly contributed to this project, donating my weekly charity money to a JNF-sponsored fundraising activities at my synagogue school. I have certificates to show that the trees were planted in Israel in my name. But when I visited Israel later in the year, I realised the darker purpose of the massive tree planting project. I found many of the wooded parks planted on the sites of Arab villages razed to the ground by Jewish militias in 1947-48. So, having, having ethnically cleaned or massacred villages, they reduced the houses to rubble, put earth over the top of them, and then went into the lovely environmentalist green project of planting pretty trees. Oh, isn't it lovely? What lovely... The, the, the cynicism of these people is something that we'll encounter again and again and again. But let's get back to the corruption of politicians uh, in our country and in America. And here's a report which I got on the internet very shortly after I'd, I'd, I'd become wired and, and got my first computer. And it was a report published in a number of forums uh, on the Counterpunch uh, website, which is a reputable uh, right-wing website, anti-Zionist website. The origination of it was the IAP, the Islamic uh, Association for Palestine um, and it has a news service called the IAP News and this is an account of a verbal brawl which uh, Ariel Sharon had with Shimon Peres in the parliament, the parliament building of the Neset which was overheard and which was reported uh, and I'll read you just two paragraphs, short paragraphs of this report According to Israel Radio, in Hebrew, Kol Yisrael, Shimon Peres warned Ariel Sharon Wednesday that refusing to heed incessant American requests for a ceasefire with the Palestinians would endanger Israeli interests and turn the U.S. against us. At this point, a furious Sharon reportedly turned to Peres and said, quote, Every time we do something, you tell me the Americans will do this, will do that. I want to tell you something very clear. Don't worry about American pressure on Israel. We, the Jewish people, control America, and the Americans know it. And that report has never been contradicted by anybody. It has, has, you, been denied. it has been denied. Has it been denied? I think it's been denied. Ah, well, I've yet to. Perhaps you could email me with the denial. Oh, no, I don't know the details, but I, I, should, I remember that quote. I remember, of course, I remember the quote, but I think it's some sort of. Well, we should take those denials then rather in the spirit that we take the assertion of America's leading rabbinical authority, who, when a couple of days ago, uh, Rabbi. Um, oh, Yosef, who was the head chief rabbi of Israel, representing the Sephardic community, um, a chaplain to the Israeli Defense Force, and spiritual head of the Shaz party, which has 11 members in the Neset. So he's not an insignificant figure. And he said, Gentiles exist.